you are invited to uh, ask me questions during, during the talk. So I will discuss um, the application of affine symmetry and coherent states to quantization of singular uh, gravitational systems, uh, namely mini superspace models, but also for, uh, for investigating the resultant uh, dynamics. And I will mm, present several um, uh, examples, but the, the main point of this, talk, of this talk will be a discussion of the quantum dynamics of uh, Mixmaster. The Drogę, the Gosien, tak? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But first, uh, let me begin by uh, very rapidly uh, um, rec recalling the um, diagonal Bianchi class A models. In these models, the spatial, spatial leaves are uh, identified with a free parameter group, and if you identify the killing vectors with left invariant uh, uh, fields, then right invariant fields and uh, dual, dual uh, uh, forms are suitable for expressing the, uh, the homogeneous metric, uh, the, uh, the, the components of the, of the, of the um, spatial, spatial components of the metric. And the, the respective Cartan equations encode the structure constants of, this, uh, of, the, of the respective D group. And I will assume that, that this is a, a diagonal, diagonal model, and the metric components will be parameterized by uh, Michener variables. So beta 0 is, uh, is logarithm. So a to 3 times beta 0 is volume. So beta 0 is an, is an, is an isotropic variable. And beta plus and beta minus describe this um, anisotropic deformations to the to the spatial leaf. Um, the gravitational mm, part of the constraints reads this. So you have a kinetic part, the the expansion, the, the isotropic, um, the energy of uh, isotropic expansion of contraction, and the the kinetic energy of the anisotropic motion, and it all takes place in a, uh, in a potential which, uh, which results from the increase in curvature. And uh, and the potential, the potential, there are zero, one, two, and three wall potentials. There is also a uh, Bianchi type one model, which is, uh, which is absent in this slide, where there is no, uh, where there is no wall. And this potential is uh, coupled to the isotropic expansion because as the universe contracts, the, this wall uh, moves apart. So I will discuss um, quantization of Bianchi 1 and Bianchi 9 model, but I see no difficulty, no immediate if difficulty in extending these uh, this results to other Bianchi models. Uh, okay, so... Uh, also, I will include a barotropic fluid with uh, W being the pressure to energy density uh, ratio. I, I use the so-called Schutz formalis, but it's kind of trivial in this case. And so th this extra term corresponding to the energy of the fluid appears in the constraint. Let me make one, one remark about the uh, Misner's paper um, on quantum cosmology. We know that he did not succeed in resolving the singularity, but uh, the problem was that he used what is called the Misner, the Misner time, omega or beta zero, as the internal clock. Uh, but in uh, but in this clock, the, the Hamiltonian flow is complete, so the, the singularities are pushed to ah. So the singularities happen when beta zero goes to minus infinity, and the, the Hubble rate blows up. So in his, in his Hamiltonian formalis, which he attempted to, which he quantized, and he did not succeed in resolving the singularity, uh, the Hamiltonian flow is complete. So from the point of view of Hamiltonian formulation, there is nothing to, there's nothing to resolve. Also, uh, also this kind of ray belling of, of, uh, of internal clock uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, 
improve the situation because you still have um, you still you still have the, uh, the particle mm. on the universe hits the singularity at some fixed value maybe finite this time value of clock so what you do in fact you need a different slicing of your of the of of constraint surface with internal clock of the dynamics orbits of dynamical orbits to introduce really incomplete incomplete flow in a Hamiltonian formulation and and I believe that the way to do it is to, to choose such internal clock that um, that uh, the solutions within this model arrive at the singularity at different values of the of this clock and then you have incomplete incomplete Hamiltonian flow and you can you can uh, try to see what uh, quantization of this of, of this kind of formulations uh, leads to so I will choose as my internal clock I will choose the variable t which is associated with the perfect fluid uh, and consistent with this choice is a redefinition of the phase of the of the isotropic of the isotropic uh, part of the phase space namely uh, you, 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 so you introduce new, new variables, Q and P. Q is exponents to uh, of, of beta zero times some constant. So it's a volume-like uh, variable. And accordingly, there is a transformation, canonical transformation for, for P. So now the isotropic part of the phase space is a half plane. And the singular, the singular states lies at the boundary of the phase space at Q equals zero. Uh, and in this choice, uh, uh, the, the, the constraints, if you put it in a linear form with respect to momentum conjugate to the, your choice of internal clock, will have this uh, you know, regular uh, kinetic, kinetic, um, uh, kinetic term. You, at each level set of t, you, in, you introduce the Dirac bracket, which is defined this. So what I simply try to say here is that all other, uh, all other um, variables, uh, Poisson bracket between all other vari variables vanishes. So beta 0 and t 0 are, are not any longer in the canonical um, format. They're, they're not part of the phase space. And in this, so in this formulation, you obtain a physical Hamiltonian, which reach, which uh, reach, which this C1 and C2 are some, some arbit some constants which depend on on the fluid that you choose. Okay, so you have this Hamiltonian it generates uh, physical motion with respect to, to your internal clock T, but the isotropic variables Q and P form a, a half plane and you, you arrive at the problem how to define the quantization of the half plane because the, the, the canonical prescription is uh, covariant with respect to the group of translations. You have translation in P and translation if in Q and at the quantum level it is realized by Weil-Heisenberg group but here you cannot translate in Q because at Q, because at Q0 you have the singular states and the, the phase space uh, ends there. So here it cannot be implemented. And at the same time, you want, to, uh, you want to keep the covariance of the quantization. So you want to have some, uh, some symmetry of the phase space. And a way, to, a way to do it is to use the affine symmetry, about which you heard already today, before, in the morning. So the affine group uh, can be identified with the half plane, and it can be it can be seen as a minimal group of canonical transformations in this in this half plane. So it will uh, preserve the symplectic structure. The left action of this group uh, on itself is defined in this in this way. The the generators, the infinitesimal generators of this. Uh, of this action are defined here, and they are called dilation and translation. But this is translation in P, because translation in P you can keep. And they satisfy, you can compute that they satisfy the following Lie, the Lie bracket. Uh, 
the, the canonical generators of this, uh, of this vector fields are observables, Q, position, and D, I would call it dilation, and they satisfy this algebra, which is, of course, uh, homomorphic to the, to the, to the Lie brackets by, by, by the virtue of Jacobi identity, simply. May I ask a stupid question? Yes. You can always take a logarithm of Q and the corresponding momentum, and it is... Yeah, but, I, uh, but what quantization would it be, then? Just a oh. R2 quantization. This is a um, canonical transformation. But in these variables, you would have kind of nasty, nasty Hamiltonian, for example. This, so this is, yeah. in a sense, no, consistent okay. with this choice. But what do you yeah. mean by canonical? Will be different. Yeah. Because what do you mean by canonical? There are no preferred uh, basic variables like position and momenta of, of particles. Like it's, it's all abstract. So when you go to another plane, yeah, okay. there are no okay. unitary really transformations. And momenta, but of course so I think I think you need to I think you you need to keep covariance. Because what if if you if you now given a, f a sphere and you want to quantize a sphere, mm -hmm. so you have to at some point you have to. Uh, drop the idea that canonical quantization is something that uh, that rules the heavens. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So luckily, there exists a unitary irreducible and square integrable, uh, uh, in which sense square integrable I will tell you soon, uh, representation uh, in, uh, in this space. So uh, square integrable functions on a half line uh, of this group and is given by this formula. And uh, so there are two parameters, Q and P. And uh, there are two uh, self-adjoint generators for this, uh, for this group. And this is exactly dilation and translation in momentum, that is position operator, and they satisfy this, this algebra. So notice that the the gen one of the generators of the Weil-Hasenberg group, the, the momentum operator, is not well defined. I mean, it's not self-adjoint on the um, on the half line. So here it was replaced by another self-adjoint operator, and now we will uh, and now we will I will propose a quantization procedure which is covariant with respect to uh, this symmetry. Uh, okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. What you propose is simply the parameterization of the Fine group, where you shift where you shift this uh, zero point to minus infinity. Mm -hmm. But topology will be the same as for the Fine mm -hmm. group, nothing. But you cannot use this quantization by Heisenberg law in this case. It's completely different. Yeah, yeah. The quantization will be different. Completely it different structure. Perfectly now. The, uh, the group of sim classical symplectomorphisms are not translating uniquely into the group of unitary exactly. transformations. Okay. Exactly. It will be different. Yeah, the representations will be different and so on and so on. No, no, yes. it will be perfectly all right as a quantization. Another model simply. Okay. 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 okay, okay. I withdraw this question. Okay. okay, so let me define affine coherent states. They were defined today already. So it's a map from a phase space to a, uh, to a Hilbert space mm -hmm. uh, defined through elements of this um, unitary representation of the affine group acting on some fixed uh, vector, the fiducial vector, which is normalized. And admissible vectors also have to satisfy this condition uh, in order to for the group to be integrable. That is, uh, in order to have this um, this identity, this, uh, this relation, that is that um, this uh, states resolve the identity. Because uh, this, thing, this, this constant has to be, of course, finite. And it happens to, 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 to be equal to this, um, this integral. So, uh, so this is, uh, these are, they are called affine coherent states. And now we can uh, implement the affine coherent state in quantization, coherent state quantization. So it's defined, you have seen this map uh, already today. 
So to an observable of the phase phase FQQP, you assign an operator which is integral over the, uh, where you smear the, the observable with projectors, projector value measure uh, made of this uh, coherent state. This map is, of course, linear because it resolves the because the coherent states resolve the identity to um, to one you get the identity. Real functions are um, promoted to symmetric operators, and moreover, I think this is feature which is not even possessed, which is very interesting. It's not possessed by uh, by canonical quantization. Is that semi bounded functions are uh, promoted to semi bounded operators, which are self-adjoint. I mean, there are self-adjoint extensions, for example, the Friedrich extension. And this map is covariant with respect to the affine symmetry. That is that if you take an oper uh, operator corresponding to observable f, and you transform it by a unitary uh, transformation, uh, uh, by an element of the, of the group, of the representation of the affine group, it would be equal to the operator corresponding to a the same observable, but let's say transported with, uh, with the affine group acting on the phase space. So this is the key property which we managed to keep. Um, okay, so let's see how, how it works in practice. If you take a posi uh, position it's mapped to a position uh, operator, the, the, the usual one, uh, with some coefficients, which depend on the choice of family of the coherent states, on the choice of the fiducial vector. And um, momentum is mapped to a momentum, the usual momentum operator. Uh, if, you, if you insist, you can, you can demand C0 equal to C1, that, that, that is equal, that, that you you will get canonical commutation rule, if you insist, because this quantization gives you a lot of freedom. Uh, the other property is that if you quantize the kinetic term, you will obtain momentum operator, uh, momentum operator square plus some potential. This k is always positive. So it's a repulsive pot potential, which you can see it will uh, it will, um, let's say, shield the singular states at q equals zero. So it will have a very important dynamical role in the, in, the, in the singular models. But at the same time, it is very interesting because if this k is larger, and it usually, it usually is, larger than 3 fourth or equal to the 3 fourth, three, three this, uh, this operator is essentially self-adjoint, this unique uh, self-adjoint operator. That is, you don't have to impose any boundary conditions. Uh, if, if, if k is equal to zero, for example, then this deficiency indices are one and one, so there is a U1 space of self-adjoint extensions, and you have to choose, for example, the, the shift of phase at when the wave function reflects uh, against the boundary. Uh, if you quantize Hamiltonian of this type, so here you have some potential q to mu. You will uh, so you will have this uh, this part which we already discussed, and you will have uh, q operator the power of mu times some dressing constant. So in this quantization, you will have uh, dressing constants, but again they are usually very close to one. But by the choice of fiducial vector, you can you can you can uh, make them equal one or other. So, so, so this quantization is nice because it's, it gives you a freedom uh, to, to adjust the quantum theory to your, I don't know, physical intuitions or ideally to some observational constraint. You, you, you can ad adjust the quantization procedure. OK, now let's discuss specific models. First, I will start with closed Friedman uh, Lemaitre universe, and then, then I will get to the Bianchi 1 model. Uh, so classical uh, Hamiltonians of this form, so you have ex isotropic, isotropic expansion. You have the isotropic uh, part of the curvature, intrinsic curvature. So the Hamiltonians of the form of harmonic oscillator with uh, equilibrium point 
at the, um, at the singularity. The affine quantization will lead to this uh, quantum Hamiltonian, so we'll have this repulsive potential and possibly some dressing constant. I use here parameter nu, with which... What is nu? It's a parameter with which you parameterize your quantization, because you can parameterize your fiducial vector by any number of parameters you want, right? So at the end, your quantum theory will uh, depend on these parameters. So here you have to... K equal u? For, for, for instance, what? K depends on mu. K is a constant which appears in your model. Yeah, and a mu? Is constant. Uh, no. I mean, you can choose whatever you, you can choose. Uh, no, but you, if, if you change mu, J will change accordingly. Yeah. So it's not. Well, but one of them can be your JSS parameters. Ah, no, no. But there can be more parameters. So okay. there can be infinitely many <laughs> parameters, in fact. So uh, just from the semi classical point of view, the equilibrium point is shifted to. to to this point, away from the singularity, so the singularity is resolved. In this simple model, you can uh, you can determine analytically the spectrum eigenstates, but I will spare you the, the the formulas. Let me quickly move to the to the nicer part, where we can so we can use uh, the phase space using the coherent states. We can we can uh, build a phase space representation of the of any state, and the the square of the absolute value of this phase space representation gives you a phase space probability distribution. It, it, it corresponds to what is called uh, Husimi function in, uh, when you use the standard coherent states. So it's this affine um, corresponding uh, object. So it gives you uh, probab real probability distribution that is everywhere positive, it's, 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 it's normalized, and here I have plotted the phase space probability distribution of the uh, of the eigenstate of the universe. So you say you see that the universe. Um, so this is simply uh, mm, center around the equilibrium point. Mm. But to, uh, we, you can also take some non-stationary state. In this case, I took, the, I took a coherent state at some point here. And you can follow at equally space-time. You can uh, follow the, um, the evolution of this uh, probability distribution. And you see that the, the probability distribution undergoes uh, a smooth bounce. And it comes back to this initial point. And uh, the spreading is uh, it's not growing at, uh, at any visible rate. Of course, this is a very, because everything is in Planck units, so it's a very unrealistic, unrealistic solution. So that's why the spreading is comparable to the size of this, uh, of this trajectory. But, uh, but th this is just because we, uh, it is a very unrealistic solution. So the, um, of course, the maximum of this, uh, of this uh, probability distribution draws a trajectory in the phase space, which, which gives you some understanding of the quantum dynamics in terms of classical uh, variables, yes, Q and P. And I like to develop this kind of understanding. So it's called semi-classical portrait. And in the next talk, uh, Arthur will, uh, I will give you just a basic, uh, basic tool, but Arthur will, sh show you how you can develop this, uh, this method. So the exact quantum motion is, what, it, what is it? It's, 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 it's a curve in a Hilbert space which minimizes the following quantum, um, quantum action. Now, we embed the classical observables in the Hilbert space. Th these are the coherent states. And you, uh, and you, um, confine, restrict this quantum action to the space of this coherent state. So you pull back this, let's say, this quantum action to the, to the phase space. And then you minimize it uh, by, by independent variation of Q and P. And you find that you obtain a semi-classical solution, which is given in terms of this classical, uh, this Hamilton equations of motion, when uh, H semi-classical 
it's just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the, mm, in the coherent states. Um, of course, at the same time, so it's a semi-classical motion which takes place in the phase space, but at the same time, you have some approximate uh, quantum motion in the Hilbert space defined by this map, so where this is the coherent state. So let's see how it works with this model. So when you compute this expectation value of this uh, quantum Hamiltonian, you will obtain this expression. So, so it has the same form, but the, mm, this coefficients k and j will in generally slightly change due to this extra, um, due, due to the fact that you, that you compute expectation value of these terms. And you find that the, that the classical trajectories generated by the classical Hamiltonian uh, are replaced by semi-classical trajectories which uh, undergo this bounce. And the, um, the regime, the quantum regime, the regime where the quantum correction uh, become important is defined by this relation, where Q times Q is of the order of, of K or smaller. You can, uh, so this semi-classical solution you can translate into the Friedman equation, the, semi the modified semi-classical Friedman equation. And here you will see this extra uh, terms. Again, some, some um, dressing constant will appear, but more importantly, this repulsive potential will appear in this, uh, take this form in the, uh, in the Friedman equation. Uh, w, you remember, is, from th is the pressure to, uh, to energy density ratio. So it's, let's say, weakly dependent in the interesting regime, weakly dependent <coughs> on W. Uh, and you have the constant uh, K. So the singularity is resolved because for any, any type of matter for W smaller than one, this repulsive potential will grow faster as you go to the singularity towards the singularity. And you can compute, again, that the, this, uh, this, this, uh, this repulsion, repulsive uh, potential will start to play an uh, important role in the dynamics where uh, volume times h bar will be smaller or equal to, to Planck scale times square root, squ square root of, this, of this constant k. And you know, we can it is definitely some kind of a toy model, but you can, you can, um, but you can use observation uh, to uh, to put bounds on this on this uh, on this k. And for example, in this paper, you can find some bounds uh, from cosmography, from primordial nucleosynthesis, or just from the fact that you require that that the mm, quantum corrections do not. Um, play an important role in the dynamics before the energy density is at the Planck scale. So you have, you have this upper bounds for K. So the correction cannot be too large. But at the same time, you can find that the correction cannot be uh, too small, because if the correction is too small, the universe collapses to a very small volumes before it bounces. So the bounce is very sudden, very abrupt, and this kind of um, this kind of uh, behavior of, uh, of, the, of the isotropic background can lead to a production of gravitational waves uh, with very large uh, amplitudes, and actually we computed this. So if you, if you assume that K is uh, uh, smaller than this bound, the amplitude of the gravitational waves produced at the, at the bounds would be too high and would, uh, would definitely uh, violate the, the observational constraints uh, now today. Okay, uh, very briefly about the affine quantization of Bianchi type 1 model. In Bianchi type 1 model, you have uh, isotropic expansion and you have, uh, and you have also anisotropic mm -hmm. expansion. You have shear, which, which uh, features here with a minus sign. And remember, uh, we used, this is equal to the energy density uh, of, of the fluid times the scale factor to, to a respective power. 
So this thing has to be positive. And this is, uh, this is uh, and, and it, it's not always positive. So this is difference with Friedman models. But uh, again, let me briefly say about this K. So K square is just P plus square plus P minus square. But this is, um, this is constant of motion. So we replace it just with K. And canonically conjugate variable, I will call it PK. And it describes, uh, I call it shape function, because it's the only dynamical variable which, which uh, tells you how the shape of the space uh, evolves as the universe approaches the singularity. So here you have the extra constraint, and uh, positivity constraint. And with affine quantization, just an integral quantization, you can very simply implement this constraint. So there is some part of this, uh, of this classical phase space which is not, uh, which is not uh, uh, allowed from the point of classical physics, the, which, which doesn't include classical uh, states. And this is, and this is not uh, a reason of a particular parameterization that you use. It's just a topological feature of a, constraint surf of a constraint of this particular model. So independently of your parameterization, you will always have to deal with this kind of um, extra constraint, I'd say. So uh, quantization, I just, I just show you the formula because you can expand it, but it will be very, uh, very difficult to handle. But we can use, again, the semi-classical portraits to take some insight into the dynamics of this model. And when you do this, you obtain that the semi-classical Hamiltonian, which generates the semi-classical motion, is given by this, um, uh, by this formula. So here you have, again, this this repulsive uh, potential. Here is the shear, because the shear can be very large, so this, in fact, can be, can be negative. So this term comes, uh, comes to help in uh, preserving the positivity of the, of the total expression, which we imposed by this uh, quantization. But again, the singularity Q equals zero is shielded by an infinite potential, as you will see in the next slide. So here you have a classical dynamics of the Bianchi one model. So Q goes to zero, uh, P, uh, P blows up. This is a contracting branch, this is expanding branch, and there is a, there is a phase space in between which is not, uh, which is not allowed uh, classically. Here is the behavior of this shape function. So it describes the, the, the ratios between different scale factors. So in this case, you have, you have two types of singularities. You have a uh, Seeger-like singularity, that is one scale factor uh, blows up and two of them vanish, or barrel-type singularity, that is uh, one scale factor is finite and two of them vanish. And all of them lead to this singular behavior of this shape function, PK. But uh, the, the semi-classical Hamiltonian generates uh, different d dynamics. First of all, you ha have this transition from contraction to expansion across this region, which is classically forbidden. So you have a nice smooth bounce. And at the same time, the behavior in this shape, uh, shape function is also uh, smooth and doesn't blow up. So the singularity is resolved. Here is a quick, um, a small picture about how the uh, expectation value, so classic expectation value of uh, of operator theta. In so so you see, so here you have you have uh, contour pl contour plots of the classical Hamiltonian. So it goes to zero here, it goes to zero here, and here is negative, and this is forbidden. And then you put this into the theta function, and then you quantize and compute the expectation value. And you see that you don't have this uh, steep, um, steep behavior that it, uh, that it uh, goes to zero here, but you have a smoothing of, the, of this theta function in the phase space. So this is like a general feature of, of, of quantization. That is, it smooths the classical observables. And this smoothing allows you for this crossing along the classically forbidden region. Okay, 
Now I'm moving to the final part of my talk, unless there are some questions regarding the, the previous material. Yes. Uh, if you are using this uh, coconut state, the perturbation and this so-called big or small, small uh, quantity, this, this product Q pi and phi, and you interpret it as a, mm -hmm. a wave function in this variables, one needs to be careful because Q pi are not orthogonal as normal. Yeah, it means a phase space representation. Yeah, phase space representation, yeah. but then probabilistic interpretation also cannot be so, so straightforward. Yes, of course, of yeah. course. <laughs> one need to make yes, this is an overcomplete of, uh, no, uh, over complete uh, events are set of states. And there are events which correspond that this q pi phi, mm -hmm. if you take, mm -hmm. then this uh, square, uh, yeah. um, absolute value square, doesn't mean exactly that this phi is at the point q pi. Yes, yes, but with some probability. No, this is, this probability has to... Uh, yes, I know, because the state is also, also spread. It's yeah, spread, okay. yeah, it's not, a, it's not, yeah. I okay, I propose to go for Okay, so now coming to the main part of the talk, and many quantum dynamics of mixed master universe. This is the most interesting one because First of all, it is a most generic one in the sense that all structure constants of the of the of the Lie group uh, don't vanish, and because it's, it, it it seems to play an important role in our understanding of the generic singularities. So let me start. So uh, it is it has this this metric a diagonal metric again. This is the Cartan equation. So you have one, all the constants, all the structural constants are equal to one. And this is the classical constraint. So the classical constraint can be divided into two parts. You have a part, uh, isotropic part. So you have kinetic uh, part of the ex expansion or contraction uh, and uh, intrinsic isotropic intrinsic curvature. And then you have anisotropic part, which is this, uh, it describes this anisotropic motion, energy of the anisotropic motion in this, pot in this uh, complicated um, free wall uh, potential. So the dynamics is uh, such that this, so it's a, uh, so uh, the spatial leaf is deformorphic to, to a free, sp free sphere. So, t so this free sphere contracts and uh, at the same time, there are these anisotropic deformations which oscillate as the f uh, as the and deform the sphere as the universe contracts. And uh, maybe I should include the matter, but because classically the matter doesn't matter, so I will uh, I will skip adding the matter. But so I will work with this con just with this uh, gravitational constraint. But uh, there is no problem with adding this <coughs> this matter at any any step that I'm going to show you. Again, the isotropic, the isotropic uh, variables are the half plane, and the anisotropic ones are two planes, the usual Misner variables. And then you apply the quantiz affine quantization to isotropic uh, variables. So we get this, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian constraint, so repulsive potential, possibly some dressing factor. And at the same time, you apply canonical quantization to these variables, because this is the, because it will be covariant with respect to these translations of the, of the, of the full plane. So here you can possibly have the dressing uh, constant due to this affine quantization and just a regular canonical quantization of potential. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is how this uh, anisotropy potential looks like. As the universe contracts, this, this walls, exponential walls, uh, move apart. And uh, the spectrum, uh, as uh, in Eva has showed in her talk uh, yesterday, the spectrum of the respective Schrodinger equation for a fixed, uh, uh, for a fixed time, for a fixed uh, beta zero, for a fixed uh, volume of the universe 
uh, is always discrete, purely discrete. And in literature on quantum dynamics of X master, people usually use these two approximations, harmonic approximation, which is valid in the, in the limit of large volumes and low excitation uh, levels of anisotropy, or steep wall approximation, which is valid in the regime of small volumes and large excitation levels of anisotropy. But when you want to study quantum dynamics, a quantum dynamics with a bounce, you, you probably won't be in any of these regimes. And then probably the best, ap uh, the best uh, I mean, a very useful approximation, which was pointed out by Eva yesterday, is to use this total approximation. Okay, oh, the, the game is always about uh, determining the spectrum of, this, of the respective Schrodinger equation, yes? The, uh, the, the eigenstates and eigenvalues. So once you are in analytical control of this, then you can go and study the dynamics of the, of the full model. Here for this presentation, I'll use this simplest harmonic approximation, but uh, you, can, you can simply replace all the formulas with other if you know the, sp the spectra and eigenstates. OK. So to study dynamics of this model, I will, you can use molecular physics approximation. So the Hilbert space naturally uh, can be decomposed into the tensor product of isotropic um, Hilbert space and anisotropic Hilbert space. And the isotropic Hilbert space, as I showed you already, can be approximated by these coherent states. So now the constraints is of the following form. You have, you have uh, isotropic uh, expansion. Here is the isotropic um, intrinsic curvature and this repulsive term. And here is the anisotropic uh, part of the Hamiltonian. And it can, be, it, it can be expressed if you know eigenstates of this, of this Hamiltonian, you can express it in this way, yes, as projection of eigenstates mm, with the respective eigenvalues. And of course, as, uh, because the, the, the potential is coupled to the isotropic expansion, so the eigenstates and the eigenvalues will depend on Q, on size of the universe. So now the simplest approximation is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, in which you assume that uh, the anisotropy is in a fixed eigenstate. And the isotropy geometry, the isotropy um, motion is approximated by coherent states. And when you use this approximation, you will arrive at this uh, semi-classical constraint with which uh, you can produce uh, semi-classical equations of motion. And look what you get. We will, we'll do it in a moment. A slightly uh, better, but still adiabatic approximation is the Born-Huang approximation. Uh, in this case, you include uh, you know, some minimal coupling between the fact that, that because here you assume that mm. As the universe contracts, the eigenstates uh, of the anisotropy instantaneously uh, adapt to a, new, to a new size of the universe. But in fact, this is not the case. So, so this is what bon huang approximation uh, takes into account. It takes into account that will, there will be some um, coupling between the rate of change of these eigenstates of the anisotropy uh, and the rate with which the universe contracts. This can be done formally. Um, with the use of some Q dependent, volume dependent unitary operator, which maps your anisotropy eigenstates, which depend on Q, on some fixed Q independent uh, eigenstates. And then if you transform this operator, this uh, Hamiltonian constraint operator, you will see that there will be some uh, uh, you know, extra term due exactly due to the fact that these eigenstates uh, depend on Q. S and this will produce, in fact, it will produce, uh, if you compare it to Born-Huang, Born-Oppenheimer approximation, it will produce this kind of term, which is again uh, repulsive, uh, repulsive uh, potential, have the same, the same form. And the uh, OK, so this is about adiabatic approximation. 
But the most interesting case is the non-adiabatic approximations in which you allow the anisotropy state to evolve uh, freely. To be, you can change. There can be excitation or decay due to the behavior of, of the isotropic geometry. This just means that you take this part of this Borg-Huang, but here you don't use a fixed eigenstate, but you use, uh, let's say, U-transformed anisotropic uh, Hamiltonian. So this is an operator. It doesn't depend on isotropic Hilbert space because we have uh, compute because we have uh, approximated the space with coherent states. So it, Q, it is a QP-dependent operator on the anisotropic. Hilbert space. Okay. Um, so, in case of the uh, Friedman, uh, in case of the adiabatic approximation, uh, you will get Friedman-like evolution. That is, this uh, anisotropy eigenstate. Well, uh, will <coughs> act as a barotropic fluid, uh, producing fueling the contraction of the universe. And the universe will, will bounce, as, as I showed you previously, it is slightly squeezed in, in, uh, in comparison to, to, to the figures that I showed you before, because I use a slightly different definition of Q and P, but because there is no fluid. And there, the existence of fluid um, leads to a more convenient choice of Q and P, which was slightly different. But this is the same solution, because because in the harmonic, if you look at the mm, constraint equation in this um, adiabatic approximation and harmonic approximation of the anisotropy potential, the anisotropy acts as uh, radiation. So in a fixed eigenstate, it will add as, act, add as radiation, acting on the, um, on the isotropic part of the geometry. So you have a Friedman-like equation where the anisotropy uh, can be interpreted as you know, energy density of matter can be put in this form. But in fact, this rho A is associated with the anisotropy eigenstate. And it scales as A to 4. Mm, OK. Now about the vibronic approximation. The non-adiabatic approximation. So this is our constraint operator, which acts on anisotropic uh, part. So how to, de how to derive the equations? The, the equations of the anisotropic isotropic variables are obtained just by computation of the expectation value of this operator on uh, anisotropic state. And then uh, using the and then using the Hamilton equation. So here you you, de you uh, differentiate with respect to p. Here you differentiate with respect to minus q. Then you have a Schrödinger equation for uh, evolution of anisotropic state. And then you have a constraint equation. And all these equations are are uh, consistent. If I added matter, this, this constraint, semi-classical constraint equation would drop out. And this, uh, these equations are time reparameterization invariants, invariant, by the way, it, because we don't, because I didn't include the fluid. So, uh, so within the harmonic approximation, you can you can uh, run some numerical simulation and see what it leads to. So here you have um, the isotropic, the, uh, the scale factor, the bounds of the scale factor. Here is the behavior of the Hubble rate. What, what I do, I start with, uh, with uh, anisotropy with a second excited eigenstate, and then see what happens. And you see already here that the bounds is slightly, slightly asymmetric. So there's a faster expansion here than contraction here. There's a slight uh, as asymmetry. And let's see why. So I started with second um, uh, excited eigenstates. So the population of this eigenstate was, uh, was 1. And at the bounce, it dropped. 
to some smaller value. But at the same time, population of other eigenstates uh, increased. For example, the eighth, if I, if I can see uh, it right, the, 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 the population of the eighth eigenstate increased slightly. And here you have a, a plot of populations of a few eigenstates. So you see the initial eigenstate drops, but others are uh, excited. And uh, the mean excitation slightly uh, increases during the bounce. Uh, so, so it's very easy to understand why there must be a slight. So this is a very slightly, I would say, slightly non-adiabatic behavior. Uh, so we can understand why there is this asymmetric bounce. Because when you have excitation of anisotropy, after the bounce, it must be this energy of anisotropic expansion has to be balanced by isotropic expansion, by the virtue of Einstein equations, yes, the constraint equation. So when you produce, produce uh, anisotropy, you at the same time increase, increase the, um, uh, the speed of, of, uh, of expansion. Here you see the, uh, how spreading is. Uh, so initially there was no spreading because it was fixed eigenstate, and the spread grows. And okay, so so you see, so the Friedman, the quantum Friedman models can be seen as very particular, namely adiabatic solutions to the Bianchi type nine uh, model. But ge but gen general solution will be non-adiabatic, and there will be some excitation of anisotropy at the bounce, and the excitation will lead to a expansion after the bounce. Let's say uh, extended uh, period of extended expansion, just by the virtue of the constraint equation. And you can you can estimate the extent of non-adiabaticity. You can look on what it depends on, and you can parameterize. You can uh, so, uh, so it's done here in this way. OK, this is my last slide. But I want to allow for discussion. So maybe I will uh, shorten what I uh, intended to say. So you neg neglect, the, neglect the back reaction. You assume that, you, that the adiabatic of the background is, that the behavior of the background is adiabatic. So it's fueled by some fixed eigenstate. But you allow at the same time for excitation, like V2 or excitation. You want to see how much excitation you can produce. And you can identify a parameter, which we call stiffness parameter, which is, uh, which is uh, responsible for, let's say, the stiffness of the bounce. The, the more stiff the bounce, the more sudden it is, the more excitation it produces. And it happens, so if the universe goes to very, very small volumes before it bounces, the, the, the bounce is more uh, more stiff and leads to uh, larger, uh, more excitations, and you can. And it depends. It depends. It is inversely proportional to the square root of this k associated with this repulsive potential, and proportional to the excitation level of uh, anisotropy or matter, because matter and anisotropy in this approximation scale scale in the same way as, as radiation. Radi uh, so <coughs> this can be, it can be just uh, anisotropy, or it can be anisotropy and matter, and radiation, for example. And then you can compute how much uh, you can produce aniso an of anisotropy in the bounce, and you will find that the excitation number, the final uh, excitation level of the anisotropy is proportional to the k square times initial excitation number, but k square, but k depends on the excitation number. So you have uh, dependence of this type. So uh, the final level of anisotropy, excitation level of anisotropy, depends on the initial level uh, of excitation of anisotropy to the power of three. So it's a non-linear, highly non-linear, non process, and you can expect that you can very easily break the adiabacity and produce a lot of uh, anisotropy at the bounce, which will lead to this uh, accelerated 
uh, expansion, extended uh, phase of accelerated expansion. After the bounce, you can even estimate for the realistic universe. And that's, that's, that's more or less all I wanted to say. Sorry for the speed. Type 1 model? I think so. Let me go there. Uh, yes, this one. So oh. classically, the Hamiltonian is not positive. But then you okay. introduce a positivity condition and you quantize it. Yes. And it's no surprise that you get the repulsive potential because it's your positivity condition. Well, you well, I could use this Hamiltonian. I yeah. could use this Hamiltonian as my classical Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because the physical, uh, the classical physical motion takes place only in this region when this is one. So it's like multiplying by one. I am free to modify my classical uh, no, expression for the Hamiltonian without changing the dynamics. And the classical Hamiltonian up there. Here. Why do you impose the constraint x greater than zero? It's because of the construction. Because I started, I included the fluid, uh, that is, uh, here you see, this is, my semi this is my classical physical Hamiltonian, and it comes from this constraint when, when, I, when I brought it to a linear form with respect to PT, and PT is positive, it's positive, because it's the energy of the fluid. So, so why does that, so that implies for some reason that you are and a structure here is now bound, now bounded, it's which, which is independent of the singularity. So which which an is by this condition, and I don't see where that should be physically. Why that should be implied by? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I can you repeat? I assume that what is not bounded, that the shear is not bounded. Right. You assume that it is bounded. If H is positive, the shear term is bounded from the. No, uh, no, but you know the dynamics can happen mm, again. It's not bounded in this region. You, if you follow this classical trajectory, the shear will become unbounded. It grows unboundedly. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, as you impose that this term, this Hamiltonian is bigger than zero, uh, then you're imposing this. You don't compute this there, but maybe there it disappears by hand. Right? So because I don't. So the thing is, I could. What I could do, I could solve the constraint completely, classical level, mm -hmm. and get rid of this, of this part. Mm -hmm. But it's there. But if I get rid of it, I have a contracting branch, an expanding branch. Branch. So I will don't. I won't get a bounce. And of course, getting a bounce is an art. Yes, it's nothing that you must get. So you have to somehow play a game with this uh, with this Hamiltonian formalism, I would say. Uh, it's nothing surprising to me. Yes. Because we are that the linear momentum is positive, so it implies that the other parts are, uh, are positive. positive. Yes. Uh, so, but you are imposing that. So this comes from this position. I know the well, is, is that the energy density of matter is positive. This is my model. So you want to allow it to be negative? So okay. again, so I propose to shift the, the discussion to the break because we must have some break. <laughs> 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 Five minutes, okay? <laughs> so then